Good morning. morning. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church. Uh, My name is Pastor Brandon, serving alongside uh, Pastor Cale. Uh, We're glad that you're here joining us uh, for worship. Uh, If you want to take a moment at some point in the service to fill out the attendance card, Uh, if you're visiting with us, there's a yellow little slip of paper. If you're a a member, there's a white uh, piece of paper, and those can be uh, put in the basket on your way out. Uh, We're continuing on our series called Back to the Basics. We've talked about faith alone, grace alone, and this week uh, we'll be looking at uh, how we're saved in Christ alone. So that'll be kind of the theme running throughout our our songs, especially our readings uh, this morning. With that, we'll begin with our opening hymn. begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, 
In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 20. The prophet writes, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, and then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sets the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson for today is, uh, is from Romans chapter 6, and Paul writes, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. 
For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit uh, were you getting at, the time, at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, please rise for the Alleluia. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A d disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. When I tell you, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are more valuable from, than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon hymn. Thank you.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. Think about when you've heard that phrase, or when you've spoken that phrase. Maybe it's after a child has spilled some milk, and there's no use crying over spilled milk. It's not that big of a deal. We'll get you some more. Or you're in a little fender bender, and you get out of your car, and you kind of look at the damage, and you realize, yeah, your bumper may be on the ground a little bit, but it's not that big of a deal. Duct tape. We'll just stick it right back on. It'll be just fine. Uh, last night at the, uh, the, our Saturday service, uh, had a little uh, slight uh, spill of some of the common cup wine, which is not ideal. You want to be reverent about cleaning up and whatever. But I looked at my robe, and I'm like, I think I'm all right. It's no big deal. And then I get here this morning and realize uh, there's a little bit <laughs> on the side, but it's the blood of Christ. We're covered in it. It's not that big of a deal. It'll come out in the wash. Just a little bit embarrassing. It's not that big of a deal. It's fine. I'm reminded of the, uh, one of my uh, favorite scenes uh, from a movie called Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There, there's a pretty famous scene in there where you, you've got uh, the Black Knight who's trying to stop King Arthur from uh, passing, and uh, what ends up happening uh, basically is that uh, the Black Knight ends up losing one arm, and then the other, and then his legs, and the entire time he insists, it's not a big deal. He goes, I've had worse. But your arm's on the ground. He said, it's just a flesh wound. It's not that big of a deal. Right? And, and the, the scene is played pretty comedically for the audience because we know, of course this is a big deal. It's ridiculous to look and say, it's not dangerous, it's fine, it's not a big deal. What I want us to consider this morning is that we tend to have that same attitude towards our sin. It's not that big of a deal. In fact, in, in many churches today, that's actually the message that's given about sin. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Or even further, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to change anything. You can just be who you are. So more than just it's not that big of a deal, it's, there's no problem at all. And when we refuse to acknowledge that there's a problem, when we refuse to see that things aren't the way they're supposed to be, that's when things really spiral and get out of control. See, our tendency is to look at our sin and say, it's, it's not really a problem. And yet there's a cost. All idols demand sacrifice. All idols demand sacrifice. There is a cost for our worship. There is a cost for our rebellion. There is a cost for our selfishness. See, there's a cost for our conflict. When we become convinced, I have to win this argument, I have to be right. There's a cost for worshiping at the idol of our pride. The cost is... Ultimately, that relationship, the cost is trust. What we sacrifice at the altar of pride is most often the people whom we love the most. Because all idols demand sacrifice, even when we're worshiping ourself and our own correctness, our own intellect, our own pride. There's a cost. The, the, the sins that, that we, we tend to keep arm's length from everyone else, that, that no one knows what's going on. There is a cost for that, even if other people don't see it. There is a, there's a cost for lust as it fractures relationships, as it changes the way that we see others. Instead of seeing people as someone for whom Christ died, we end up seeing people as products to be consumed rather than people to be loved. All idols demand sacrifice, and there is a cost for our sin. Even those, those idols that end up starting out as something good, something noble, like providing for our family. When we take that godly desire and we turn it into our ultimate desire, when we end up worshiping at the, at the altar of greed, all idols demand a sacrifice. And so we end up sacrificing most often 
time with the very family that we're investing in in order to give the best life possible. We end up sacrificing perhaps our integrity as we we go too far in order to accumulate more and more and more. We sacrifice our peace and our sanity because we eventually realize that it's never enough. There's never quite enough sacrifice at the altar of our greed for us to be satisfied and content. All idols demand sacrifice. There is a cost for our sin. Even kind of the the, the American dream, wanting to be famous, wanting wanting to be successful. And more than that, not even for ourselves, but wanting that for our kids, for, for our grandkids. Wanting them to have everything they could possibly want. That good, godly desire can very easily turn into our ultimate source of satisfaction. What do we sacrifice? The altar, the idol of success. Most often, we end up putting our expectations onto that child, and we end up sacrificing sometimes their health, sometimes our relationship, uh, their, their stress, their emotions, by putting all of this on someone so that they can succeed, and it actually ends up resulting in the opposite of that which we wanted. Because that's what idols do. They promise everything, and at the end of the road, we find out the road is closed. And all we stare is a cliff leading to death and destruction. Every idol, whether those that started out as something godly or something that were sinful to begin with, all idols demand sacrifice. There is a cost for our sin. And so we can't just look at it and say, it's no big deal, it's not a problem, no one knows, no one else is affected. Because there is always a cost. Our sin. And as church, if we ignore that, if we say nothing's wrong, everything's fine, we're only furthering the path of destruction rather than inviting into the path that brings true freedom. See, this is what Paul is so concerned about in Romans 6. He's led the foundation that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, but the question at the end is then, then what do I do? Should I just continue to sin? That that, that I may receive more grace, that grace may abound? Paul goes, by no means. And he outlines why we can't do that. Why we're called into this new kingdom. Here's verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. When you were a slave of your own sin, when you were only thinking about yourself, when you were worshiping at the altars of these various idols... You were free in terms of righteousness because you didn't care what God thought. And that always sounds like a good thing. No one can tell me what to do. I don't need to care about God's commandments. I don't need to care about how he defines uh, my my relationships, how he uh, wants me to live, what he wants me to do with my stuff. I'm free. It's always what it seems. And yet Paul continues and shows where that freedom truly leads. This is verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The end result, the exit lane, the final destination for all sin, all idolatry is death. Death of relationship, death of integrity, death of a reputation, and ultimately, and most concerningly, spiritual death as we choose to follow our own way, to be our own God rather than following the God who has created, redeemed, and saved us. The end result is death. And so we can't look at, at any sin and say it's no big deal because it, it is leading towards some kind of death and destruction and less the idol is destroyed first. We can't do this on our own. And so instead of just leaving us to our own devices, instead of saying, all right, you want to worship other gods? All right, let's see how that goes for you. God intervenes. Verse 22, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves 
of God. Let's pause there. That doesn't really sound like freedom. I've been set free from sin, and now I'm a slave of God. It seems like I've just changed masters. Am I truly free? Yeah, that's the point. You have indeed changed lords, changed masters. Instead of being a slave to sin, instead of having your own desires lorded over you, leading to sin, death, and destruction. You now have a new master, a Lord who lives and reigns not as a tyrant, but as one who loves and cares and provides for you. See, and what are the fruits of that lordship? Paul says, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. One path, one worship leads always to death. Another, a gift, leads to eternal life. See, at first we look at this transition into this kingdom of God with Christ as our Lord, and we think that that's not true freedom. Freedom is me getting to do what I want. The reality is Christ as Lord instead of us is the gift. Because when we're free to our own devices, it always leads to us putting ourselves back into slavery of, of, of our sin, of our desires, leading to the death of, of relationships, the death of integrity, the death ultimately of our relationship with God. See, you and I, when we are in charge, uh, when we are our own God, we tend to just cause all sorts of problems. It's like parents, if you've ever left your, your uh, kids and say, hey, all right, oldest one, you're in charge. You leave, you go to the other room for a few minutes, and then it's quiet. So you go back in, and what's happened, well, you know, one child has a crayon in his nose, the other child is missing a shoe, and there's stuff everywhere. And you go, I was gone for like 10 seconds. How could this possibly have happened? I, I kind of wonder how often God looks at us when we choose to follow our own way and say, how do you think that this is the right way to live? And yet, instead of like we do sometimes as parents where we get frustrated and we, we all, God looks at us with love. And he cleans up our mess. And he restores us back as his children. See, that's why he is Lord and not us. And it's also why... Christ alone is Lord and not any of the other idols that we want to put next to it. It's not, well, yeah, I'm saved by grace through faith, but yeah, I also have uh, this this problem with greed, with gossip, with lust, and that's just fine. Uh, It's not a big deal. No, Christ reigns alone because all those other paths, all those other idols lead to death. They are killing you. That's what sin does. Does and so Christ comes so that He may reign alone. And this leads to Paul speaking some of the most famous verses in all of Scripture for the wages of sin is death. If we don't get this, we're going to continue to, to, to coexist with this sin that is parasitic, that it is killing us. The wages of sin is death. The end result, however large or small, however public or secret that sin, that idolatry, that worship is, however correct in our world it may seem, the end result is death. And on our own, dead in our sin, what can we do to rescue ourselves? Because trying harder doesn't work. Trying to give it up for Lent doesn't happen. Trying to make a New Year's resolution doesn't stick. On our own, we are dead in our sins. You and I can't resurrect anything. Christ can. That's why it's all about Him. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You and I, we can't resurrect anything, but Christ can. And He has. See, on the cross, He carried our sin, our idol worship, our rebellion, our rejection, and He took the death that we deserve, the end result 
of all of that sin. He took that on himself. And on the cross when he died, so did your sin. And yet the grave could not hold him. And when he rose from the dead, he brought new life. That's gift of eternal life, not just someday, but today. For you and for me, that we would not live as slaves to sin, but that we would live confident in the eternal life that God gives in righteousness. See, that's why at Zion, we kind of make a big deal about Jesus, because it's all about Christ. Christ alone, as we receive his true presence in his body and blood, as we're baptized into his death and resurrection in the waters of baptism, as we hear his word, as we preach Christ and him crucified, it's all about Jesus. See, we don't need to minimize our sin. We don't need to say it's no big deal. It's just a flesh wound. It's not a problem. No, because the wounds of Christ on the cross were not mere flesh wounds. No, by His wounds, you and I are healed. We are restored. We are forgiven. We are brought back into the family of God. That's why it's all about Jesus. We are saved in Christ alone. He is the only hope that we have in this world. And yet he's the only hope that we need. In Christ alone, we are saved. We are forgiven. We are restored. That's why it's all about Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen. This time we continue with our children's message. I invite our kids to join me uh, up front. Morning, guys. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about math today. Is that okay with you guys? How many of you guys like counting? You guys, you guys like counting? Yeah. So I want to, what do you think? How high of a number can you count? How many of you guys can count to 10? Right? Many of our adults can't. No one's raising their hands. All right. You guys, you know, we can count to 10. How many of you guys can count to 100? Count to 100? Yeah. What about a million? Can you count to a million? Oh, that would take way too much time. Right? So Jesus says something really cool in our gospel reading. Here's what he says. He says, the very hairs of your head are numbered by God. Now, how many of you guys can count all the hairs in your head? How many of you guys can count the hairs on my head? I've got a, I've got a lot less number here. Right? No. The, the, you, you know why, why Jesus says that? It's not to say God can count really high. No, why does Jesus say our, our, the hairs on our head are numbered? It's because he loves us so much. He knows everything about us, the, the, the good and the bad. He knows everything about us, and when he looks at us, he loves us. And, and he values us so much that, that he, even the hairs on your head are, are all numbered. God knows you, he loves you, and so when you pray to him, does God hear you? Yeah, he knows every hair in your head. He knows everything about you. And so, so when you talk to God in prayer, he goes, yes, my child is talking to me. And he loves hearing from you. When, when we read his word, is God speaking to you? Is he active? Yes, because God loves you. Every hair on your head and my head is numbered. It's not about how high God can count. It's not about how much hair we have. It's about how much God loves you and me. Let's take our hands and let's fold them. I'm going to say a few words, then you guys repeat those back to God in prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus to give us value, to bring us into your family, and to give us your love. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
All right, guys, thanks for coming up. You can head back to your seats, and uh, we'll continue uh, with the bringing forward of our offerings. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you uh, that you give us the greatest gift of all in Christ Jesus and all the other things that we enjoy in our day-to-day lives. We return to you a portion of what you've given to us, and we pray that you would bless these, our tithes and offerings, that your gospel might be proclaimed both to us and to those outside the church, that they may know your Son, and that salvation comes through Christ alone. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In our prayers for this weekend, we have a couple of petitions to add. Um, we want to pray for the family of Jim Jones. Uh, Jim, of course, is a foreign, uh, former Zion member here. He passed away on Saturday the 17th and was given Christian burial on Friday the 23rd. I want to pray also for Harry Richter, uh, the brother-in-law of Pastor Meyer. He's having heart surgery, so we want to pray that that goes well. Um, and then uh, every, everybody got married this week, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole bunch of anniversaries, which is really awesome. So uh, thank God for uh, Joshua and Hannah Pinnell's first anniversary on the 24th, uh, for the 42nd wedding anniversary of Tim and Dee Dee Leary that they celebrated on the 20th, uh, the 60th wedding anniversary of Ron and Donna Howes that, they celebrated on, or that they'll celebrate on the 29th, and then Ken and Marla Ray's 40th wedding anniversary, uh, which is on the 25th. But as you're able, please rise for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For the households of this congregation, that our Father in heaven would overcome division with unity of faith, give wisdom and peace where there is anger and strife, and bless parents with faithfulness to teach their children. We pray especially for uh, Keith and Tracy Gokel this weekend, Donna Gottlob, Jeff and and Faith Grazier, uh, Tom and Donna Greco, Ron and Tara Green and family, Chris and Kelly Greer and family, Scott and uh, Kim Griffith and family, Alice Gunderson, Laverne Goosewell, Levita Goosewell, Lana Goosewell, and we give thanks also for all those who celebrate their anniversaries this week, for Joshua and Hannah Pinnell, Ron and Donna Howes, Ken and Marla Ray, and Tim and Dee Dee Leary. For all these things and all these people, let us pray to the Lord. For the authorities of our nation, that God would bless them with wisdom to seek the common good, deliver them from temptations to promote evil, and oppose his will, and give them penitent hearts and confidence in his grace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For a love of God's word, that through the world, that though the world treats it with derision, we would hold fast to the scriptures and declare God's praises. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For rescue from fear that he who delivers our souls from death would strengthen our faith to walk before him in light of everlasting life. And for all those who have requested our prayers, we remember especially today Jeff Sticht, Jane Acey, Brian Hendrick, uh, Renee Valerie, Marianne Deering, Becky Bodenstaff, Joan Berry, Eunice Weber, Hilmer and Anna Mae Shanebaum, Frank and Ann Shanebaum, Fred Dorr, Pat Benefil, Joan Goosewell, Becky and George Smith, Carol Booz, Marlon Shanebaum, Joy Lotz, Danny Wiesman, the family of Jim Jones, Debbie Griffin, uh, Jeff Frome, Patty Potter, Harry Richter, Anna Mae Hale, Ty Neiman, Richard Dupatz, uh, John Payton, Carl Monaco, Kathy Dudley, Bill Alanya, Scott Rombach, Robert Rombach, Dale Jones, Don Goebel, Joshua Harris, Mae Seymour, Paul Knobloch, Catherine Manson, Missy Wiesman, Henry Yavin III, Jennifer Withrow, Sheila Williams, Terry Zirkelbeck, Becky Ranke, Sharon Morton, and Renee White. Lord, in your mercy, be merciful to us, O Lord, and hear our prayers. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be led into the truth and be steadfast in the confession of Christ. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you've prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated for distribution. Uh, here at Zion, we, we believe a couple things about communion. We're talking about in Christ alone, and, and we believe that in communion we receive the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus for the, for the forgiveness of our sins. We also believe that uh, communion is a, is, a con, is a confession of our unity in, in our confession of faith as, as Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Lutheran. So if you're not yet a part of our confession of faith, uh, we still invite you to come forward to com for communion. If you would just cross your arms like this, we'll give you a blessing as we come around and, uh, and be very happy to talk to you more about, uh, about joining up with us. Uh, God's blessings to you in this time of worship.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Again, for joining us for worship. We pray this service will be a blessing to you as you share Christ with others this week. Uh, a couple things that we have uh, coming up. Uh, first is on uh, Tuesday, uh, this Tuesday at 6 o'clock, our uh, young, young adult group is having a game night uh, hosted uh, at the Metcalf House. So if you want more information about that, it's in your bulletin or you can talk with me uh, afterwards. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, the uh, next thing is that next Sunday at the 1045 service, we'll be having the installation uh, of our Director of Discipleship, Barry Pfeiffer. Uh, so that'll be at, at that service. You're welcome to join us for that. Uh, it, that was from the voters meeting a week and a half ago. That uh, contract was extended. Uh, we extended a call to Kayla Ridgeboy to be one of our teachers now that she's finished her colloquy uh, program. Uh, and uh, the voters also uh, agreed to start a call process for an additional teacher. Uh, this next year, we'll be teaching our first and second grade combined class. Um, and so if you have anyone you know that, that might, might be a good fit for that uh, position for our, our school ministry here, uh, please pass that name on to either the school office or the church office uh, within the next week or so. Uh, and the plan is then uh, we'll do interviews and, and have a candidate to vote on at the July voters meeting. Uh, the uh, last thing I have is today is, is the, uh, the, the golf tournament. Uh, funders are for Zion Lutheran School. So those of you guys that are, uh, and gals that are participating in that, uh, best of luck. I'm not participating, so last place is still open. If you guys want to fight for it. Uh, but thank you, especially Nikki Winkleman uh, and all those that have helped support uh, and, and uh, create that opportunity for us. Uh, and uh, we're, we're thankful for all those uh, that, that support our school ministry.